silence your cell phones and any devices that would be helpful in having a, uh, an uninterrupted presentation. And we're glad to have books for sale outside this room in the Peluso Family Exhibition Gallery. Our friends from the corner bookstore will be selling those after the lecture. Um, a brief mention that everything we do here from lectures to our children's activities, to our performances, often in this room, to our book buying and maintaining our beautiful building, uh, depends on the support of our donors. The subscriptions that you pay only cover about 23% of our operating expenses. So anything that you would like to, uh, any form you would like to support the library, we would love you to join us in that effort, and you can speak to any of the staff members about that. Uh, when we moved to this building on East 79th Street in 1937, we didn't know that we were going to be next to what was to become Museum Mile. Uh, although the Metropolitan Museum arrived at its first uptown home in 1880, the Guggenheim was downtown for many years, and it wasn't until 1953 that it actually moved to a townhouse in this neighborhood on East 72nd Street, before, of course, moving in 1959 to the Frank Lloyd Wright building. The Frick had just opened to the public in 1937. But the arts have always been important to the members of this library. And for example, in the 1870s, um, about 150 years ago, a member, John Cleve Green, left a generous bequest to the library for the purchase and repair of art books, which is why we still have an alcove upstairs in stack 12 called the Green Alcove. And if you work here and don't know about it, I suggest you find out about it. It's a very large, spacious area with a wonderful chair and desk. And if you're first to arrive, you can use it for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, and we're always honored when an author tells us that the library has helped them write their new book, which is why we're additionally delighted to have Michael Schneerson here this evening. He is a longtime contributing editor to Vanity Fair, the author of eight books on a range of nonfiction subjects from My Song, the biography of entertainer Harry Belafonte, The Contender about Andrew by about Andrew Cuomo to The Killer Within, a narrative-driven account of drug-resistant bacteria, and Coal River about the mountaintop coal removal. His latest book, Boom, Mad Money, Mega Dealers, and the Rise of Contemporary Art, has been called a sparkling, high-octane account by Stacy Schiff, another author who is a library member. Daniel Weiss, the president and CEO of the Metropolitan Museum, has said, Boom reflects better than anything I have read the characters, the motives, and the overall vibe of the contemporary art world. Of course, this neighborhood now is full of vibrant <coughs> galleries, auction houses, and museums. So we're in, you're in a long tradition here. Please join me in welcoming Michael Schneers. <laughs> Night. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking here. I, um, the New York Society Library really has a special place in my heart. I, like most writers, I've been between books, and uh, this is a, a wonderful place to come up and fiddle around at the, the writer's desks and try to figure out what your next book is, um, and, and I've done that. Anyway, I, uh, uh, I wrote this book uh, about contemporary art and sort of where it came from, and more to the point, how it went from being this little circle of Greenwich Village dealers and artists to this global bonanza that we have. Um, and it's an interesting day to be, uh, to be uh, talking about this uh, because just today, <laughs> amazing news came from the art world um, that the $450 million collection of 
the late Don Marin, uh, is going to be uh, uh, sold by a consortium of dealers. This is really unusual. Um, usually, uh, a huge uh, uh, collection like this goes to Sotheby's and Christie's. I mean, and so, uh, there must be enormous cackling going on among these guys um, for having uh, pried it away from the auction houses. Um, and it's also kind of interesting, they're fierce rivals, they would kill each other if they could, um, but they're also rather charming. And uh, so that is Arnie Glimpshire, and he, uh, uh, very spry in his early 80s, he plays a very important part in my book, uh, goes back almost to the start uh, of the story. Um, that's uh, Bill Acquabella, also um, uh, a long-standing uh, dealer, actually second generation, and we'll talk a little bit about him. Wonderful man, very elegant. And there is the notorious um, uh, Larry Gagosian. Um, that, by the way, is Mark Lynch's son of Art. So, so keep these guys in mind, um, uh, because uh, they are part of the story. Um, my story really begins uh, right after the war. Um, and uh, I, I knew I was interested in contemporary art uh, of that period. Um, I mean, that's really where the phrase contemporary art be, you know, applies. Um, and of course, that means abstract expressionist art. And um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it meant, as it turned out, a number of dealers who uh, were excited enough about this art to want to represent uh, these struggling artists and try to to push them to to a prominence. And uh, Peggy Guggenheim um, uh, actually uh, had been in um, uh, the States on 57th Street uh, during the war. Uh, as some of you may know, she uh, came bearing all this art that she had bought up from artists in Europe, who, you know, with, with uh, the Nazis breathing down their necks. Um, and she, uh, in particular, uh, was taken by this artist, Jackson Pollock, and um, so he had a lot of his stuff. She didn't like it that she couldn't sell it very well, though other people hadn't yet caught on to Pollock. Um, and um, so by the end of the war, she decided she was fed up. Uh, she was going to go back to Venice, where she'd come from, and um, uh, she basically gave all her artwork to another dealer, another sort of up-and-coming dealer named Betty Parsons, and um, uh, let's see if we can have a, oh, wait a minute. No, you're not going to get Betty Parsons. Um, uh, Betty Parsons, uh, uh, a much adored uh, dealer in her day, who um, at one point, in about 1948, represented what she called her four horsemen, um, which was Pollock um, and uh, uh, Clifford Still and uh, Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko. Uh, and um, just down the hall, in the same gallery, was another dealer named Sidney Janis. And Betty Parsons actually um, rented him that space. She had the whole space. And um, uh, to her uh, fury, uh, Jackson Pollock's wife, uh, Lee Krasner, decided that Betty wasn't doing enough to sell her husband's work, and she took him down the hall to Sydney. So. Uh, Sydney, who is in the background there, uh, that's, that's of course de Kooning. Uh, de Kooning came directly to Sydney Janis, it didn't come by way of Betty Parsons. Um, everybody regarded Sydney uh, Janis as sort of the, the smart financial guy of, the, of this world, this world of entirely impecunious artists and dealers, because he had invented the two pocket shirt. Now, the two pocket shirt was something that was very helpful if you were a man in the South and it was really hot because you could doff your jacket uh, and you could stick all your, like, you know, pens and pencils and stuff in this second pocket. So he made a fortune. And with that, he stopped working in the garment district and uh, became an art dealer um, and, uh, and was a Kooning's dealer. Um, but these are only a prelude to the uh, most significant dealer of the late 50s, 60s, and on, Leo Castelli, of course. Um, Leo um, uh, is great fun to learn about, write about. He was born in Trieste. Uh, <clears throat> his family um, was Jewish, so uh, when uh, the war threatened, he was uh, fortunate enough to uh, get out with his, um, uh, his wife, Ileana, 
um, and to come with, indeed, his in-laws to New York. Um, as it happened, um, uh, uh, Leo, a very graceful guy who spoke five languages, um, uh, had had the good sense to marry a, uh, a very wealthy woman uh, whose father was um, uh, wealthy enough to uh, just buy them all a townhouse at 4 East 77th when they came over to New York. And for some years, uh, Leo uh, didn't really um, have too much to do in a formal way with art. He was, he was what you would call, in the best sense, a dilettante. Uh, he, <laughs> he, he had time on his hands, lunch breaks, weekends, he would go down and he would schmooze with the dealers and, and the artists. Um, but he didn't think he could become uh, a dealer himself. Except little by little, being encouraged by Sidney Janice and others, he decided, okay, he would. And he, um, uh, well, all he needed uh, to start a gallery was a couple of artists because he had his father-in-law's townhouse to use as a gallery. Um, so um, he, he found one uh, in Robert Rauschenberg, um, uh, who's, you know, sort of combines, as they were called, combining these various pieces and things, much of it found on the streets, um, had begun to interest people. And um, uh, so he, he, he scooped up Rauschenberg and um, uh, uh, Jasper Johns. And that became um, uh, his, his first great uh, chapter. Um, uh, in fact, um, there was such excitement about uh, Jasper Johns' first show at, um, uh, at, at, at the, the uh, Nathan's uh, Leo Castelli Gallery that um, uh, there was enormous competition for who would buy all the paintings. I mean, they were sold out very quickly. And one of the most uh, um, rapacious buyers was Alfred Barr, uh, of the director of MoMA. And it got down to one more painting that looked kind of like this. Um, and uh, Alfred Barr realized, however, that when he opened one of the, uh, there were like little hinged doors. And when he, when he opened one, there was a penis in it. I mean, I'm, I'm not a real penis, my <laughs> A wooden, constructed penis. And so he said to Jasper, would you mind uh, if I do buy this painting for the museum if we kept, kept that door closed? <laughs> and uh, Jasper said, well, uh, how often would it be closed? <laughs> and um, Mark said, well, I think most of the time. <laughs> and so, um, uh, regretfully, John's uh, sold it back to Castelli, I think it was, or maybe it was Philip Johnson. At any rate, um, that was, um, the this is, um, that just happens to be one of my favorite uh, uh, pictures from this whole era. Uh, Irving Blum, um, uh, very dapper guy, uh, who um, became the first to sort of discover Andy Warhol for a West uh, Coast audience. And he also, uh, he, he sold um, a, a lot of Jasper Johns stuff. He was always trying to get Jasper Johns to um, uh, sell him uh, a famous uh, bronze Saturn can, uh, you know, with, with paintbrushes coming out of it. And every year he would call uh, Johns and ask if he was finally ready to sell Blum this, this beautiful uh, bronze artwork. And um, uh, Johns would say with great regret, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think this year. Um, and, and so finally Blum said, are you, you're not ever gonna sell me this piece, are you? And he said, no. But I like hearing your voice. <laughs> anyway, he, he was a fattening guy. He's still going stronger, Blum. I had lunch with him the other day. Um, now, this gets us to um, uh, one of the people in the, in the picture I showed you. This is Arnie Glimsher uh, at about age 20. And um, uh, he's a, a fascinating person from the start. He, he grew up in the Midwest on, on a ranch. He, um, his, his mother decided he needed um, an infusion of art, so he, she moved the whole family to Boston. Um, and um, uh, he studied art. He actually, like a lot of dealers, he thought he would be an artist. Um, this is something you find again and again with dealers. Um, and and, and they, they reach a point where they realize they aren't meant to be dealers, or they're just not quite as good. In the case of Arnie, he went to an art school in, in Boston where another student was Bryce Martin, um, and um, uh, uh, who is, as most of you may know, 
one of the leading uh, abstract painters of our time now, uh, just turned 90. And um, uh, uh, Arnie thought he was a pretty good artist, but he knew he wasn't as good as Russ Martin. So instead, he decided to become a dealer. He was up there in Boston, and um, he um, uh, had the, the, the tragedy of having his father, whose name was Pace, um, die prematurely. And the family was walking up Newbury Street in Boston, uh, 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 perhaps just coming from the synagogue. And, uh, the, and, and Arnie's older brother said, well, so what are you going to do? And, and Arnie said, well, there's an open storefront there. I've always liked art. Maybe I should start a gallery. And the older son said, yes, we'll do that. We'll give you the money, and you'll, you'll do that. So he started up there. He had no um, um, particular artist, uh, no artist. What he did rather cleverly is get all the art teachers from his college to contribute their art, because they were all really bad, and they were delighted to have their art. <laughs> and um, so that worked for a little while. And then he got to know Louise Nevelson. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, there's Louise Nevelson uh, constructing one of her wonderful black boxes, or whatever, you know, sculptured boxes. And um, she uh, was induced to come to Boston, uh, put on a show at his little teeny gallery at 125 Newbury Street. And um, um, they really became very close. Um, uh, she was sort of like a surrogate mother to him. And uh, she was a very um, emotional woman. <clears throat> who was actually represented by Sidney Janis of the Two Pocket Shirts, but, um, uh, uh, but she was very angry at Sidney because Sidney had locked up all her work in a warehouse. He didn't want her to um, just, uh, he, he, what he really wanted was for her to do more work, and she wouldn't do it until, um, uh, he, she wouldn't do it until she could get her art back. So they were tussling over this, and she said, Arnie, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. That awful man has just kept my work locked up. And, um, and Arnie said, I will save you. And he sold what little art he had by well-known artists, and he raised money and whatnot. And he gave her $20,000. And as a result, she became um, one of his artists. Um, and um, uh, this is um, this is a gorgeous woman who is a fabulous dealer of minimalist art. And um, this was something that was going on uh, in the 60s, um, even, as, um, even as Castelli and, and, and then Arnie were um, uh, paving their way. Um, uh, and there are, well, no, we'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, Arnie uh, realized that he had to come down to New York. Uh, he was never going to get anywhere if he, was a, if he was a dealer in Boston. So he came down, um, and um, uh, he rented uh, a little gallery space at 57th Street with his wife, Millie, who is still his wife, like, I don't know, 60 years later. Uh, they have a wonderful marriage. Um, and um, Arnie was very disconsolate. The more he looked at the art scene in New York, the more depressed he became. Because uh, he could see that Castelli had gotten there first. Uh, he had signed up. Um, um, uh, Roy Lichtenstein and um, uh, James Rosenquist and uh, Frank Stella and, um, and, and Warhol and, and a few others, Clay Zoldenberg, and, um, and, and some, not all of them, but some kind of fit into a, a category you could call pop art, and it was immensely popular. Um, and uh, so uh, Arnie was reduced to um, being a kind of, as, as he said later, I mean, I, I, he was exaggerating, but he um, he felt that um, he had to kind of pick up the scraps, you know. Um, so the artists that he began to collect had nothing in common with each other, which made it interesting, um, but, but challenging. Um, <clears throat> so, all right, these guys, uh, 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 Arnie and, and uh, uh, Castelli, um, became the dominant dealers of the 60s, I would say. I mean, others came along too, but I'm trying to keep this moving along. Um, and in the, um, in the, by the 70s, um, a couple of very contradictory things happened. One was that um, there was a, a famous auction held, uh, the taxi uh, magnate Robert Skull and his wife had this um, uh, auction, which I'm sure many of you do know about, in which all the arts, uh, you know, art sold by all those artists from the, the late 50s and 60s, Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, Warhol, 
they, they did enormously well. And, and, and everybody realized, my god, contemporary art um, is, uh, is very lucrative. And uh, so that sort of changed the game. But at the same time, only a year or two later, <clears throat> the mid-70s recession set in. And for several years, um, not much was going on in contemporary art. Something new was needed. And something new came along in the person of um, one Larry Gagosian, <clears throat> whose picture you saw earlier. And um, Larry um, uh, is a fascinating guy because unlike most dealers, uh, he didn't come from money. Um, he was uh, a lower middle class kid from Fresno, the Fresno area of California, which was to say from the Armenia uh, area. Um, he uh, lived amid uh, uh, you know, Armenians on every side, every possible rel relation. Um, and he went to USC. He, uh, he had no art in his life uh, up to that point. Uh, he, he remembered his mother having one little thing on the wall, you know, some uh, uh, watercolor. Um, no one talked about art in his home. Um, he didn't study art in, in college. Um, and after college, he thought, well, I'll just you know, get the kind of job you get out here in, in LA. I'll uh, work for the uh, William Morris mailroom. And so uh, he did, and one of the people that he worked for was Mike Ovitz, the famous uh, agent, whom Larry disliked. And so he quit uh, the William Morris uh, company, which is something very few people do. And he, um, he got a job um, uh, in a record store. He got, he got a job in a grocery store. He was basically, through his 20s, going nowhere. And, and so when he was about 30, he got another job as a parking garage manager. This was a step up. And uh, he noticed every day when he was at the, the uh, parking lot, a guy down the street uh, parking his car, opening his trunk, and taking out these posters and unfurling them and, and selling them for whoever you know, went by. And um, you know maybe each poster only got about 10 bucks, but they only cost a few. So, Larry thought, I could do that too. And he went to the very same poster company from which this other guy got his posters. And he, uh, he started with you know those sort of treacly posters with cats with big eyes, but then he moved up a little bit, uh, sort of classic you know, reproductions. And before you knew it, he had a framing store in the area where he framed these things, which he realized could have made him more money. And this was pretty much uh, Larry Gagosian uh, as he went uh, to New York um, uh, to figure out what this whole New York art scene was about. And um, uh, he, um, uh, he, he wasn't a dealer. He didn't have a, a, a gallery. Um, he did have a connection. He had a connection who actually is an old friend of mine, um, a guy named Ralph Gibson, who's um, a photographer. Um, Larry out in California at his frame shop had been thumbing through a, a, uh, an arts magazine one day and seen pictures, photographs by this guy, Ralph Gibson. They're pretty cool, pretty sexy. And uh, he called Ralph and said, could he represent Ralph at his new framing store, which he was kind of segueing into being a, a, a gallery. And uh, Ralph said, well, yeah, but I've never heard of you. And um, I, you know, I don't know of any shows you've done. You'll have to come to see me if, um, you know, uh, and let me get a sense of you before we go any further in this. So Larry came to New York. He, he was a very charming guy. Ralph Gibson, another very charming guy. And before, uh, uh, before Larry left, uh, Ralph introduced him to his dealer, Leo Costelli. And um, you would have thought, anyone uh, would have thought, uh, seeing Larry up until this point, that this would not be a strong, fast friendship. Um, <laughs> because uh, Leo was a very urbane, elegant guy. He spoke five languages. Um, and, and Larry was clearly a hustler. You know, He was a tough, aggressive guy. Leo loved him. <laughs> he actually wished that he had been more like Larry. And Larry, of course, wished he'd been more like Leo. So they actually um, they, they became fast friends. Um, they didn't become uh, dealers of the same kind, if you will. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's primary art and there's secondary art. And um, uh, Leo uh, almost exclusively sold the primary art of his artists. I mean, he signed up these artists 
One of the things, by the way, you did, which is very important uh, in terms of understanding dealers and how they work and how this whole business has changed, is that he would um, give artists who needed money a stipend uh, every month or so. And it's actually what enabled many of them to live until they um, earned enough that they could, from their work, that they could do without the stipend. I mean, Frank Stella told me that he was on his stipend until 1969, which is to say he never made a profit mm -hmm. until then. Um, so um, anyway, there was that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and also, Leo was a very, um, very wise businessman. He, um, he had different gallerists around the world uh, go in with him on representing art. And as a result, they'd only get half the commission, but they'd sell more art. So that was kind of um, genius in, 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 in the art dealer uh, world. That was, that was a new uh, approach. Um, and uh, so Larry, on the other hand, was a secondary dealer. He was, um, uh, he was a guy who would come to your house, see that you had a painting on the wall that had some value on it, and know that there was someone else who was looking for that guy on the wall, and um, uh, would start calling each side. You know, the, the, the guy who owned the work would have had no thought that he was about to sell the work. <laughs> he, he, and yet here was Larry Gavosian just boom, 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 calling sometimes like 15, 20 times a day until each side sort of capitulated. And this one huh. sold, and that one bought, and Larry made a profit. Um, the other thing is that Larry, uh, Larry is, um, you know, given short shrift a lot. There's a lot of snobbism about, I think, in part a class sort of thing. Um, you know, the guy was and is very aggressive. Um, but the fact is that Larry, um, uh, then and now, had and has a wonderful eye. Um, uh, I think whenever you walk into the, any of the Gagosian galleries, um, you're always struck by how um, compelling the art is. I mean, he, he, he's really good. So it was that eye that, um, enabled him to realize the talent that was in this kid, uh, Basquiat. Um, uh, by then, Larry had rented a loft uh, at 420 West Broadway. Um, and that was uh, right across the street from the huge uh, uh, multi-floor uh, compound where Leo Castelli and a number of other big dealers had their galleries. Um, and so uh, Larry uh, rented this loft and it was on the fifth floor, and it literally looked down at Larry. And I've always thought there's something sort of like, yeah, uh, one day I will have your space. Um, uh, at any rate, um, he uh, was put onto this guy, Basquiat, by a, uh, a, a very academic dealer named Anina Nosai. And um, um, she said, come to this uh, group show. I've got this kid's work. I think you'll like it. Um, uh, Larry was completely bowled over by it. And, um, and, and, and became, if not Basquiat's formal dealer, someone who was always going down to get more Basquiat's from this kid who worked in the uh, sort of a basement studio area of Anima Nassai's gallery. And so um, uh, that began to change uh, uh, Larry's perspective. He began to make quite a bit more money. He also um, uh, introduced himself to uh, Cy Newhouse, major publishing magnate. And by the mid uh, '80s, um, uh, by the mid '80s, Larry was representing Cy Newhouse at auctions as selling Fort Newhouse paintings that were 10, 12, 14 million dollars. Um, and so, um, at the same time, Mary Boone, uh, another fabulously successful dealer of that time, was representing Basquiat. Um, and um, I'll just say a quick word about Mary Boone. She was clever enough, <clears throat> as an unknown dealer in the late 70s, to rent a tiny little space in that building 420 I was telling you about, 420 West Broadway. Um, she, um, uh, she realized something very profound. She didn't have to rent a whole gallery space. All she had to do was have like a little closet by the elevator where everyone went up to the other big galleries. <laughs> and she was very charming and sexy, and she's a good talker. And uh, people would start wandering into this tiny, uh, tiny closet of a place. And before you knew it, uh, she was um, a major dealer representing, as you probably know, Julian Schnabel, David Sally, um, 
um, uh, Ross Blackner, Eric Fischel, um, and others. Um, now, um, this is uh, a story that, I, uh, that haunts me to this day. Um, Arnie, I told you, uh, didn't have a sort of um, consistent uh, uh, group, a coterie of artists, if you will. Um, one of the ones that he most valued was uh, a painter named Agnes Martin, uh, who did these fabulous abstract um, uh, paintings that sort of look grid-like. Um, and uh, from, from a pretty early time, maybe the 70s, uh, Arnie knew just how uh, good um, Agnes was. And he did anything he could to, to get her to do more stuff, more art. So when she would call him and say, OK, um, I'm done. Uh, you can come out now. That meant getting on a plane and going to New Mexico, where Agnes lived alone. Um, she was kind of crazy. Um, lived alone um, in, uh, in an adobe compound um, in northern Mexico. And they would talk about art, and they would play Beethoven. And, and, uh, and then there would come a time when Agnes would say, all right, Arnie, show me your favorites. And uh, he would go over, and there would be, you know, maybe eight of these paintings against the wall, leaning against the wall and floor. And he knew it was coming, but he had to do it. He'd say, "All right, I like that one, and that one, and that one." And then Agnes would give him the knife, and she'd say, "Go ahead, destroy the others." And that's what she would. That's what he would have to do. As her, as her dealer, that's what she wanted. He would destroy her other paintings. So, um, you can argue that both ways. I mean, the fact is. Uh, many great paintings were probably lost, but maybe the very best are still with us. Um, uh, that is Larry, that's David Geffen, and that's, um, uh, of course, Leo Castelli on uh, David Geffen's boat. Um, what happened at the end of the 80s uh, is that a, a huge recession hit, um, it, it hit the art world. And Larry uh, has often said that David Geffen was almost the only thing that kept him from destitution because whenever Larry, whenever uh, David Geffen came into Larry's uh, gallery, um, Larry knew he'd be able to pay the rent that month. Um, and uh, you know they were they were all um, uh, friends. Um, and um, so the, the '90s. Uh, and I'm going to get up to that, and then I'm going to make some points about what's actually happened in this, in this market. Um, the 90s were an interesting time. There were, uh, uh, there were people who will tell you that they weren't that fecund uh, for art, that, that there, there were um, uh, a handful of good artists. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think a lot of interesting things are going on. Certainly a lot of interesting things are going on among the dealers. Because um, uh, uh, not only did, um, did these two guys survive the recession, um, but others came along. And um, uh, one of my favorites is David Zwerner, who uh, was indeed the, the son of a sort of wealthy um, gallerist uh, himself. And um, uh, he only wanted primary uh, artists. He was, he was determined to not represent any secondary. Secondary was seen as sort of downscale somehow. Um, and uh, uh, so he uh, became a well-known dealer strictly by doing primary art. By the way, I should say that Larry, uh, 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 despite um, outwardly professing no interest in, in representing primary art, he really did want at least one primary artist. And he decided that the one he could get was Cy Twombly. Cy Twombly, um, who was, many of you may know, is, you know, I won't call it scribble art, but yes, I will. I'll call it scribble art. Um, <laughs> Uh, very elegant, um, uh, fascinating, uh, unique uh, art. Um, he had been uh, severely criticized um, by art critics back in New York, and he had left uh, and gone to live in Italy, and was kind of out of the art scene. Larry was clever enough to recognize that he was enormously talented, and one of the few enormously talented artists who, in fact, did not have a, a dealer, at least not a dealer for Every, everywhere. So he went to see um, Twombly, and, um, and Twombly um, heard him out for a while, and Larry realized that he was not getting through to this guy. He was just sitting there, you could just, you know, Larry was a salesman, he could tell he was not making his sale. And finally he said, come on, Cy, give the Armenian a chance. <laughs> and um, Twombly cracked up, 
and they became fast friends, and Tauntley remained his uh, artist until the end. Um, so at any rate, um, that is, by the way, uh, Cy Twombly, a wonderful picture. Um, that's the way they lived. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these because um, I don't think I have time. But and I don't want to um, stop without uh, giving you a little sense of how things have changed and maybe a little indication of where we are now. It was in 1999 <coughs> that, um, that Leo Castelli died. And um, uh, uh, I, I think that while you can choose any arbitrary moment in that general time, it's as good a, a moment as any to say that this was sort of when the art um, world became the art market. Um, uh, already, you could see that some dealers were getting much uh, larger uh, than others. Um, uh, and, and, and you couldn't tell it at that time, but you would soon be able to see that there were four in particular who were really bigger than everyone. And one of them was uh, Arnie Glumsher, uh, and one of them was Larry Gagosian, and one of them was David Zwerner, I've mentioned, and the fourth was um, uh, Ian Worth. Um, who is Swiss and um, uh, basically came to the game with an enormous amount of money uh, from his wife's family. Um, and he's a fascinating story on his own, but I'll just leave him out now because what I want to say is that these were, these became the four mega dealers as they're now known. And in my two, three years of working on this book, that phrase, that concept just sort of began to emerge, um, uh, at least it did for me. Um, um, and now you can't see an art story without uh, art, art journalism without the mention of the, the, the mega dealers. They have all just built these castles down in Chelsea, um, uh, a couple of which are not yet done. Pace just opened its huge place last fall, um, uh, and um, you know there's a lot of controversy about this. I mean, uh, it's it's kind of looking more and more like any other industry in capitalism. Um, whereby um, you know the biggest guys are the last one standing, and, and the others get sort of brushed uh, to the margins. Um, now um, there are a lot of things that that, that account for that uh, over these last 20 years, besides um, uh, just the ambition of those particular dealers, which is certainly a factor. Um, one is um, the uh, increased number of art fairs fact that dealers now feel obligated to uh, take their artist's work, um, not just to one or two art fairs, but to maybe two dozen in the course of a year around Europe and everywhere else. And these, um, these uh, uh, fairs uh, can be lucrative, but they can also um, uh, lose the dealer a lot of money if he doesn't sell the art that's in his booth. So that's a tricky business. Um, uh, another is... Um, uh, is the extent to which auction houses <clears throat> have become involved. There was a time when auction houses um, just represented the art of dead artists. You know, that they, they, they didn't represent living artists. They certainly didn't represent young, hot living artists. And yet, as the art market began to, <clears throat> um, you know, to, to propel itself in the early uh, 00s, um, <clears throat> um, the auction houses became very aggressive. Um, uh, and they, um, you know, they could, in, in some ways, <clears throat> do exactly what the uh, what the dealers are doing. I mean, we all think of auctions as, you know, the uh, the, the, the hammer on the <clears throat> on the gavel and and, and, and uh, auctions happening right there. But auction houses also do private sales, and they could uh, could threaten and did threaten um, uh, the dealers uh, in that regard. Um, there's another factor which can't be denied, and that is the incredible proliferation of billionaires. Um, you know, uh, uh, we, we've uh, heard a lot about billionaires in the last 24 hours um, in politics, but um, you know, billionaires in the art world have changed everything. Uh, there were about 200 of them in 1987. Now there are about 2,000 of them. You know, once they bought their house and their yacht and their plane, you know. What's left but art, um, and, and truly they have um, embraced art buying uh, to an extent which changes everything. And, and one of the things that it changes most dramatically is the um, 
is the challenge it presents for small and emerging galleries. Um, you know, we talked about the mega dealers. Okay, great, <clears throat> but the um, but the small and emerging galleries have always been uh, essential to this whole process of cultivating new artists and um, giving them a chance to grow and giving the gallery, the small gallery, a chance to grow with them. Um, there's some very dramatic stories uh, that I came across in the book about um, uh, how, um, how, a, how a, a big dealer, one of these megas, can become aware of uh, an artist who's starting to stir a lot of talk, <clears throat> just come in and swoop them up. Um, and everybody's happy, except, of course, the small gallery that has lost its you know, new star uh, artist. Um, so, so that, too, uh, is, is problematic. Um, um, uh, I, um, I got interested as a sort of uh, corollary of this private museums fascinating aspect to it, too, too much to go into um, uh, here, but uh, it, it has a huge effect on, on the art market, because if you're, if you're a, a billionaire and you've decided to build your own you know, museum, like Glenstone, let's say, in Potomac, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., um, you have enormous power in the art world. Um, you, can, you can say, you know, I've got 12 of these uh, works by this artist, and I think you should give them a show, and I'll underwrite the show. And so, the, um, the, the, the process, the, the, the business that gets done between private museums and uh, uh, public museums, between galleries and museums, is all a bit murky. Um, if, if, you, if you get a dealer after a couple uh, glasses of wine, you know, he'll admit, yes, um, it's true. Um, you know, we, we have to give um, uh, museums that money or, you know, they're not going to be able to afford the, the show that we want them to give our artists. And so um, that's part of the business, that's part of what's made things complicated. Um, I'm going to just end uh, with a story that um, is one of my favorites from the book, and it gives you a little sense of where things are at. One of my favorite um, uh, dealers is a guy named Gavin Brown. Um, he's English. Um, he's a very ornery guy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but I don't care because he's he's really good copy. Um, and uh, so when I finally interviewed him, I knew I knew that what I was going to ask him about. I was going to ask him about the hole. Um, well, the hole uh, is uh, something that was created one day while Gavin Brown was out for lunch. Um, he uh, uh, he has a friend, an artist, whose name is Urs Fisher. I said Urs Fisher. Urs Fisher. And um, uh, this guy had come into Gavin's uh, gallery when Gavin was gone with a team of jackhammers and just blasted away and created this huge deep hole in the middle of the gallery floor. Gavin came back. Someone else might have been a little upset. Gavin totally understood. He was fascinated. Um, and so they were very happy about this. And then they sold the hole. <laughs> they sold the hole to a guy named Peter Brandt, who is a major collector up in Connecticut. And I said, but Gavin, what, I mean, how did you get the hole from your gallery up to Connecticut? And he said, oh, we didn't. No, uh, Peter just d dug another hole out in Connecticut. I said, um, really? I, doesn't that sound a little crazy? Um, and he said, you know, it does. It is a little crazy. But you have to be a little crazy to be in this business. You know, Peter's a little crazy, uh, Urs Fisher's a little crazy, and I'm a little crazy too. And you either like stay on that train or you just get off. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I'm going to stop here. Uh, I wish I had time for more. Um, many, many things that I put down which I was going to share with you, but I think we. You all need to. Could you take it down? Yes, of course. I I would be delighted to. Let me just see by the way. Oh, that's Ivan Worth, the fourth of the mega dealers. That's it goes in with a guy named Joe Violet that he poached from uh, the Canada Gallery, a little gallery. That's Gavin Brown. With the hole. Okay. Uh, that's his hole. I'll stop there with that. Anyway, uh, anyone? Uh, yes, sir. This book and the Como book are astounding to me. 
But how do you get these people to tell you the things that they tell you? <laughs> What's your process? In that? Well, um, uh, with the art book, uh, which I guess is, is more, well, let me focus on the art book. Um, I knew that the people I most wanted to talk to would not talk to me initially. Yeah. Um, that is, the, more, the four megadeers. They're very self-important. You know, Larry Nagos is not going to talk to me. I was not established as an arts writer. He wouldn't have talked to me even if I was. Um, but I did what any journalist does in that situation. You just <clears throat> climb up the food tree. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, or the food chain, I should say. Um, I had a couple friends uh, in Safe Harbor who are artists. Eric Fischel is one and his wife, April Gornick, and they're very sweet people. And Eric knows the whole art scene. And I invited him over to dinner and just said, I want to try to do this book. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just interested in this whole craziness with the prices, the market, and how it all happened. Who should I talk to? And he said, well, talk to my, um, my dealer in London, uh, Victoria Moreau. She'll, she'll talk to you. So my wife and I went over to London. We walked into this gallery. And it was an amazing gallery. It had this sort of pond in the back. And the pond was filled with these big silver balls. And we, like idiots, said to Victoria, that's really great. Who did that? And she said, oh, it's this um, Japanese painter who's having quite a revival. His name is Yayoi Kusama. Oh. And I uh, said, oh, OK. We walked up the stairs. There was another painting by the same artist. You know, Yes, that was also Kusama. Well, let me just tell you how stupid that is, okay? She's the best known artist in the world. The idea that I was setting out on a book and I didn't know <laughs> is so ridiculous. Um, and she couldn't have been, I mean, uh, Victoria was very nice about it. She put me in touch with Gavin Brown. Anyway, what began to happen was a, a chain of, of uh, one and another. And what you do is you write a letter to the next one and you say, oh, I'm doing this book. And I've interviewed so far, do, 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 and I'd like to interview you too. And it, you know, everybody wants to be in the cool group, right? So once <laughs> you've interviewed some people who um, are pretty well known, you've been lucky. I got lucky with Eric, you know. Then the others all want to be part of it. And believe it or not, that's how I got right up to uh, Larry Gagosian. I had interviewed uh, the other three mega dealers, and I. Wrote, got in touch with him, I said, you know, this book is going to go to print. Their, their voices will all be in, the, in it. Uh, I'd like you to be part of it, too. And he said, well, come in and we'll talk about it. So he came into his office right down the street here. We talked for a while. Um, at one point, he said, you're not recording this, are you? I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just listening to you, you know? Um, and at the end, he, he said, gave me a, a, a kind of cocked an eye and said, you don't actually need me to do this, do you? And I said, you're right, I know. There are actually a lot of articles about you from like 30 years ago, which were actually very interesting. And, and, and there's a lot of stuff in there. I could do it without you. said, in that case, I'll talk. <laughs> so, so anyway. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I would say that Larry, uh, um, Larry is, if not the overarching reason that I did this book, he certainly is prominent in, was from the beginning, in my mind, because he's a fascinating guy. I forgot to mention, I'm sure you all know, that he's gone from one gallery to two to 16 galleries around the world. He is um, uniquely um, at the top of the pyramid. Um, and I, I had gave some sort of sneaky, serious thought to doing just an out-and-out -out biography uh, of Gagosian. I think it would have been really hard, because I think if I'd approached him that way, like, hey, I'm doing a biography of you, whether you like it or not, he would have shut every door he could. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who would have shut their doors if he told them to. Um, and I just thought, why, you know, why have all that sort of pressure and anxiety? Why just not go in a totally different way and say, I'm, I'm an historian, essentially. I'm doing a history of how the contemporary art market evolved, your field. I just want to know how it happened. And with that, virtually everybody talked. Um, you know, they, they love talking about that. Um, so, um, anybody else? Yes? Uh, you mentioned the number of billionaires. Yeah. 287, now 2,000. Right. And is this U.S. or just U.S.? No, I think that's global, actually. Okay. 
Well, there's also a rise in millionaires, obviously. Right. And these people would like to decrease the risk of their portfolios and their financial advisors tell them to buy art for 5% of their portfolios or whatever. So this surely has contributed to the increase yeah. in interest in contemporary Well, it has. I mean, we didn't get to this, but you know, the whole thing of art advisors or you know, financial consultants. Um, actually, um, uh, Don Marin, um, uh, the, the recently deceased collector whose work is now going to be sold, um, uh, he was, uh, he took a very financial um, uh, sort of pragmatic view of this. I mean, he loved the art he collected. Um, but he, um, you know, he really set out to, to learn all he could so that he was making smart buys and making profit. Um, and he did it by and large very well. He, he was a great collector. He, you know, uh, given hundreds of works um, to the MoMA. Um, um, but, you know, most people aren't that lucky. Um, and, and, you know, for ordinary people like us to decide we're going to be art collectors, you really have to kind of be in it for the, just the sheer pleasure of it and not expect to make anything back. Um, it reminds me of a, a quote uh, from uh, Jerry, um, uh, Jerry Saltz, uh, Jerry Saltz, who's um, uh, a wonderful art critic for New York Magazine, and he said, uh, you know, the fact is, most contemporary art is crap. <laughs> He said, only about 15% is any good, is, is going to last. And, you know, he said, if only we knew which 15% it was, we could make a fortune. But the trouble is, what I think is great, you don't. And, you know, forever it will be thus, and then some people get lucky. I have a, a, a relative who's a, a doctor who has collected uh, contemporary art for 30 years, and and he's made an enormous fortune with far more than his medical profession because he he got you know Ellsworth Kelly he thought sounds good looks 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 promising um, George Kondo I mean these are names which in the last 30 years have really emerged um, and so you can do it but don't count on it yeah yeah um, I had the Charles last night see Dario Price's new bi uh, a documentary on the Nerdler scandal. Oh yeah. And I know that you were at one point, or maybe still, working on a documentary on the same subject. Yeah. Um, but do you see the the, the Nerdler scandal as just a sort of blip in, in in the modern art world, or do you see it as having a, a lasting effect on what what's happening? Um, I think that that was so outrageous. Um, and there are various reasons why I would say that's a blip. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, there is our forgery. Make sure everyone knows what that is. Yes, let me, let me, well, um, the, uh, uh, one of the things that, that makes that uh, very unlikely to happen again is, is the forger himself, the, the Chinese guy, who was able to do, you know, paintings that really Passed for Rothko's and Pollock's and de Kooning's, so much so that um, you know she could display them at <clears throat> at art fairs, like at, at the you know armory down here. It'd be a little sort of whispering, like, "Gee, what's the what's the provenance on that one?" But um, they look they look very good. It's very hard to find someone. Uh, I think it'd be fascinating to find this guy. I you know it's a pity he left the country again. He should come back and just do this for sport and just acknowledge that he's doing fakes. And, and, but they were really, really good. So anyway, that uh, was difficult. I think the idea that these 40 or 50 or more paintings um, by all those masters of uh, the post-war period um, could all have no provenance was insane. And <clears throat> it just, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that the art market it would make that mistake again anytime soon. Uh, that said, there's art crime. Um, I only deal with it a little bit at the end because who knows really, I know, is there a lot of money laundering that goes on? Unquestionably. Um, but, you know, no one seems able to, to track it. Anyway, yes? Uh, doesn't that call into question the idea of expertise? I mean, I know that the appraisers now are being sued, so it's very hard to get work Yes. and the states are now 
not wanting to authenticate words. Right. How, what, what, you know, because of the Well, litigation. authentication is a fascinating issue. <clears throat> Um, you know, if you bought a Warhol, uh, it used to be, uh, you would go to the Warhol Authentication Board and they would determine that your work was authentic. But there were some very interesting lawsuits that arose, and the problem was that um, the Authentication Board might be um, throwing its weight around for its own uh, political reasons, but it also might be that they could look at the piece you just bought from a garage or something, and they could see why it was inauthentic. But if they told you, then you would know too. You know, it, it, they needed, they wanted to preserve their um, uh, power, basically their judgment, uh, and keep other uh, fake fakers from from doing just that sort of painting that would have that little giveaway um, description. So. Anyway, so that's one aspect, and the other aspect is that um, if you uh, buy a Warhol and, um, uh, and it's been authenticated, but then the authentication board changes its mind uh, because some other works have come in, you might go to court and say, hey, I pay a lot of money for this. And so the authentication boards found themselves mired in lawsuits. Um, Keith Haring, um, anyway, others. It, it is very difficult now to find a board that will authenticate. I think that the the dealers kind of have taken that role, but how much legal liability they accept, I don't know. Um, yes? How do women dealers fare in this uh, period of art history? Oh, thank you for bringing that up. They yeah. fare really well. And, and um, uh, women in, um, in, in contemporary art uh, is, a, is a, a long and happy story, uh, starting with um, Paula Cooper, that very attractive woman uh, who uh, was, um, and is, still um, um, sort of the doyen of minimalist art. Uh, she had the first gallery in Soho in 1968. She just celebrated her 50th birthday, I think, or whatever, not birthday, 50th year in business. And um, um, then um, um, Ileana Sonnabend, who was the Pastelli's wife, and many would say, a better eye than he. Uh, she was very active as a dealer after they got divorced um, for years. Um, uh, I can think of others, but the one I'll just tell is a sort of interesting story. Lisa Spellman um, is a wonderful uh, uh, dealer who really by accident uh, moved to um, uh, Chelsea, as other dealers were doing in the 90s, and bought um, uh, bought a taxi garage, you know, one of those little one-story taxi garages that were bought down there by the river. And um, some big developer came along and wanted to build a big building that would take up the entire corner. And so he basically bought her taxi garage out for tens of millions of dollars. <clears throat> and not only that, but he constructed one corner of his huge edifice to be a gallery for her. So, you know, she's just... A happy, happy woman. Um, <laughs> and anyway, there are a lot of other really interesting women dealers. Marion Boski is one. Um, um, another time we'll talk about that. Yes. Well, you kind of alluded to some of this before, but I'm just curious in your thoughts of, um, you know, like the kind of contemporary art um, market and world in, let's say, the next generation, given, and, and some people have mentioned these things. A, the forgery, you know, the forgery and the lack of authentication. But there's something else that people didn't mention, which is I definitely hear a lot of like sort of scuffing about this particular kind of art. Like in other words, I hear many, many say anyone could do that. I'm not saying that's true. It was and, with us. And, and I know that some contemporary art, absolutely that's not the case, and it's excellent and very high quality. But there's that kind of notion of like, oh, I can paint something like that. Whereas no one would say that about you know more representational art. So given that, you know, I, I, I certainly have heard a lot of that kind of reaction about minimalism, which you very yeah. deeply touched upon yeah. a few slides ago. So I, you know, like there are a lot out there who say like this is just a trend, kind of a bubble in a generation. People aren't really going to like this kind of art. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't pay too much attention to. Um, to people who sort of say my five-year-old could have done that. Um, <laughs> although there is one guy 
that you could almost think that way about. And I, I, I have a picture of him up there. I said he was standing there with Larry Gagosian. Joe Bradley is actually a very successful um, Gagosian artist these days, but he started by doing stick figures. I mean, he literally just did stick figures on the canvas, and then he put the canvas down on the dirty ground and sort of rub it around. <clears throat> and um, it was so outrageously kind of unsophisticated that um, people started talking about it when, when the little gallery had a show of it. And the more they talked about it, the more Gavin Brown thought, God, if everyone's talking about it, maybe there's something to it. So he poached this guy from a little thing called Canada Gallery. And then Kagosian had the same reaction. He thought, wow, everybody's talking about this guy, Joe Bradley. I better poach him. <clears throat> so anyway, there are artists whose work does make you think that you're five or have done it. Um, but uh, mostly, that's not true. And, and um, it, it, it's really more about us needing to acclimate ourselves to a kind of look, a, a sensibility, a kind of art that we've never seen before. Um, I just walked uh, yesterday down to Gozian to uh, see these paintings by this guy, David Reed, and um, totally brand new to me. Uh, maybe he's been around for a while, but he just does these sort of fascinating brush strokes on big canvas, and um, you might say that your five-year-old could do that, except not really, uh, because it's very elegant, and the more you look at it, the more complex it is. So I think we'll be plenty of more complex art. I'm not worried about running out of it. Maybe one yes. more question? Uh, I'd like to know uh, where you assign the role of the art critic, especially in the decline of publications and the digital, right. uh, what we might call uh, the digital sure. marketplace, where everybody now is an art critic. And um, what, what has the uh, art dealer replaced the uh, role of the critic? No, but actually, once you say that, one thing that I did notice in my reporting is that these dealers <clears throat> are huge engines of publicity. And every few months, they will have a big gathering to announce their latest upcoming shows. And I've noticed that um, they hire all these art writers to write the copy. And the essays or whatever. And you mean the catalog essay? Yeah, the catalog essay or whatever might accompany the the gathering, the press gathering. <clears throat> but you have, you have press agents and you have critics. Right? right, yes. Well, it's really the critics. I mean, the critics are being um, uh, hired to do these, these uh, essays. And really, it seems to me, um, having their own independence um, uh, somewhat shanghai. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, I, 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 but another answer to your question is that um, indeed there are far fewer critics. Um, because nobody will pay them. Yeah, the, except the galleries. That's the funny thing. Yeah, Instagram is a factor. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Jerry Saltz. He's a, a terrific um, old world art critic, and he's you know always writing fascinating, provocative reviews. Um, uh, but um, but there aren't many. I mean, you know, I mean, remember Clement Greenberg and, and how important his criticism was. It, it could change the entire art world overnight. Um, you know, we don't have that. Anyway. Thank you. Will you sign books? Sure. <laughs>